All right, hi, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to our seminar. My name is Dave Strasser, DaveStrasser.com. Um, my name is Dave. This is Brian Garrity. Brian's a USC Ultimate Fighter, two and five veteran. We're going over some self-defense moves and escapes. All right. First thing uh, we're going to go over is a headlock. Okay, so my nemesis here, Gray Maynard Jr., will be getting me in a headlock like this. And what you want to do when, you, when you're in the headlock is, is, is not panic. Even though it's, it's getting dark. Brian, out. out, Brian. Good evening, folks. Uh, this is Miguel Adorati, and uh, this is the MMA Museum podcast. And uh, we're taking a walk here, one of our history uh, podcasts with a pioneer, a true pioneer, to be honest with you, a friend of mine. So I expect to have a lot of fun in this podcast. We are joined by, uh, you know, veteran of all kinds of organizations, Dave Strasser. Dave, how you been? Great, man. Absolutely great. Uh, Dave's a funny guy, uh, you know, I, I think he's doing some school teaching right now, and uh, he's become a school teacher, and he's teaching math, and uh, hopefully we'll come back and revisit that at the end of the podcast, but right now, for starters, I just kind of want to get into this, so Dave, you know, talk a little bit about your, your youth and growing up, just, you know, were you, I think you wrestled, were you a wrestler, at what point did you wrestle, and how did you become you know, caught up in the mixed martial arts? Um, well, I guess, I mean, my, my youth was a, a basic one where I, I did most sports, like uh, basketball during basketball season, baseball during the summer, um, and we just played football out in the yard with people and stuff like that. So, but the structured sports was just baseball and uh, basketball. Um and my mom didn't want me to play football until high school. So I went out my freshman year in high school football. And I was like, we only had like 14 kids on the team. And I was really little. I was like 100 pounds, maybe 105 pounds. And I was like the only one not to play. And it was like, my dad was a football star and stuff like that. So it kind of hurt me. Like, you know, I want to be like my dad. I want to be the high school star and stuff. But it did not start that way. And it was frustrating and stuff like that, but it was one of those things that I, uh, you know, I stuck with it. And 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 I think that made me just the uh, the year on the bench and just being down. I said, well, you know, I gotta build myself up. So a lot of my friends were going for basketball. I said, no, I, it's not going to help me in football for going for basketball. So I chose wrestling. I, I said, you know, what? I'm gonna go for wrestling. Never wrestled ever. And people are like, well, why are you gonna go for wrestling? These kids have wrestled, you know, some of them, you know, middle school, grade school. I said, well, it's going to get me better. I don't care if I ever wrestle, but it's going to get me better for football. And that was my my goal. So I went out for wrestling. And actually, one of my one of the guys on the team um, at the time was he was on the football team. He wrestled in grade school. He would almost be like, you know, kind of a, be considered a bully now. And he said, man, I'm going to beat you in wrestling. I'm like, all right. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. So he challenged me one day. And I'm like, fine, I'll wrestle him. And. So I wrestled him and beat him. And then I was like, good, that kid's got a mouth and stuff like that. But we actually became real good friends and stuff like that. Um, but then it was one of those situations that, so I started wrestling. And they said, why don't you do a wrestling tournament? I said, no, I, I don't want to wrestle. I just want to train to get better for football. Um, but they said, well, there's this tournament coming up. And it was like uh, uh, West Dallas Central. is one of the biggest tournaments there. And so they put, they, they put me in there. And it was at 110 pounds. And back then, you, I didn't know how to cut weight or anything. And I was like 112 the day before. You know, you wrestle, <laughs> you weigh in the morning. And I'm like, that's two pounds. And I'm like, yeah, I just lose it. So I lost the weight the day before, you know, not knowing how to cut weight. I just didn't eat nothing. And I, you know, I made weight that night. And then I didn't eat or drink anything until the next. It was like at 6 o'clock I made weight. And like the next morning we had to weigh in at 8. I didn't eat or drink anything. And I think I weighed in like at 100 and. 507 pounds or something ridiculous and it was for 110 pounds i think it was for freshman tournament so i i went there and stuff and so i was an eight seed because i never wrestled before and these other kids had you know they had records for that year like my first wrestling event. 
And so the first kid, he took me down, but I kind of escaped, turned around, you know, took him down and pinned him. So I pinned the number one seed kid. And then they said, okay, you know, next one's going to be coming up or something. And I was just hanging out with my buddy. We're eating a hot dog or something like that because I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, they announced me. I said, oh, I got to go wrestling. I said, I'll coach you. So my buddy coached me wrestling. And uh, it was one of those situations that, you know, he was like putting the half. And the guy would turn away. He was putting the other half. You know, I was jumping half. And he was just putting both halves. So I, I did that, and I got a penalty point. Um, but then I really, you know, because I like, hey, you can't do it. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, first wrestling. I mean, so that was like the only point I gave up. I beat him like eight to one or something like that. And I went to the finals and beat the kid like nine, nothing. So it was my first wrestling match. And, you know, I really kind of got into wrestling. And so, what... so, so now I, I knew you had a wrestling background, obviously. So you started late as a freshman, but obviously I'm, yeah. I'm going to feel pretty good uh, because of, of, of what we went. But how did you meet Yasunori Matsumoto? Because, that's where some of the MMA stuff begins in your world. Yeah, well, to go back, that wrestling, one of the kids on the wrestling team, Dale Porter, his dad was Dale Porter, which is a real famous boxing guy. He goes, hey, you should try boxing. So I picked up boxing while in high school and wrestling. So that was kind of my, my start of MMA. Boxing and wrestling is probably the two bases. So that's where I started. He was like a legendary trainer, and he took me to tournaments and stuff like that, and I just go box and stuff like that, wherever he told me. What happened then, I went to college, and I'd come back in the summer and do boxing or I'd wrestle. I mean, I, I played football in college up in Oshkosh. I did rugby. Um, I went with the wrestling team a couple times just to practice and stuff like that. Um, but in the summer, then I'd do boxing. When I graduated college, I moved to Chicago, and I got a job as a live-in foster parent. So I had to live in a boys' group home as the foster parents, 22 years old, and these kids were from 16 to 18. And so when they said, okay, you're off now, you don't have to be back till like 10 o'clock at night. So I was off like a lot. I found a gym, Chicago Fitness Center, right by Wrigley Field. You know, I was living in Wrigleyville. And that's where Matsumoto was training. And they were training in the Shidokan style, which is a bare knuckle style. And so I picked it up because, you know, I needed something to do. So I did that. Um, the bare knuckle karate and stuff like that. And then they started, that was that time where they started like kind of adding throws and in, and in, in like 15 seconds on the ground type thing. Um, okay. So they kind of, they, they, they call it the uh, triathlon of MMA. So it was bare knuckle and then we did kickboxing and then we did some ground, like really light ground. Okay. Um, now, and he was, let me place a little perspective on this. This is circa 1995, 96 era that you're in Chicago and you come across Matsumoto. Matsumoto will be famous for uh, fighting Pat Miletic in Pat Miletic's debut. Um, and the story behind that fight is that Miletic at some point broke his arm and Matsumoto kept fighting with a broken arm. So yeah. we're, we'll get to that, but I'm going to let Dave take us there. Yeah, so that what happened was while I was training at the uh, Chicago Fitness Center, they said that there was a... Uh, a bare knuckle world tournament they're going to do out in Japan, the world championships of the Shidokan, and they needed a 155 pounder. And like I said, in high school, I wrestled at 167, but I never cut weight. So I said, well, 55, I could do that. So I got in shape, got my weight down to 55, and did the bare knuckle. I did the bare knuckle there. Matsumoto was our heavyweight representative from the U.S., and I think it was like 42 different countries went there. Um, and I had real good success. It was my first tournament and I had real good success that they wanted me to stay six months. So Matsumoto told me to stay six months. As soon as I got off the plane, I've never been on a plane, never been on a country. So I'm like, all right, I'm, I'll stay six months. I said, what do I do? He goes, don't ask questions. I said, I mean, what do I eat? Don't ask questions. Whatever they do, make you do, just do it. You know what I mean? So I'm like, all right. Um, so as I was there, um, you know, because they made this big program and stuff like that about this, the world tournament and stuff, they said, we can't just send you with one year of training. We have to kind of beef it up. So they put that. I was a Golden Gloves champ. I was a Thai boxing champ. I was, a, you know, all these titles I had. Um, and I had fought Golden Gloves. I took second in the Chicago Golden Gloves in like the Masters division. 
But it was like, I never did kickboxing. I never did Muay Thai. Just practiced it. But they had to put that in a resume just to make it sound like I was a legitimate competitor. So as I was there, I would have, they just wake me up in the middle of the night, take me to fights, have me fight, run hills, do whatever. So I, I did whatever. It, well, that was the time I think the UFC was coming out or just before I left it started coming out or something like that. That's where um, Tom Latuli started promoting the shows in Chicago. Um, I think it was called Chicago Combat or something like that. And that's where Matsumoto entered, and that's where he fought Pat Militich. I think Rick Gravison fought on the card, um, a couple of other guys. And uh, Matsumoto fought um, Pat Militich, and Pat got his back. I mean, he was mostly wrestling, got his back, and came out and, like, armbarred him, but he would not tap. Matsumoto was one of those guys that would not tap, would not quit. I believe he broke his arm. They kept fighting. He was probably a 20-minute, 30-minute fight, whatever it was. Because back then, we didn't have time limits. And that's when I came back and, you know, he, he fought and stuff like that. He couldn't even move his arm. I remember that. I'm like, why don't you just tap? He's like, no, I have honor and stuff like that. Where I'm like, all right. I mean, end of the day, it's kind of a sport. You know what I mean? Yes, there's an honor thing. Um, but that's where he was doing that. And I did a couple more kickboxing matches and stuff like that. And I kept saying, I want to learn more ground, more jujitsu and stuff like that. And Matsumoto would say, no, no, we don't do that. We do, you know, bare knuckle. Shidokan is what we do. Shidokan cry. We don't add things to it. And that's why I said, well, I think it'd be better if we did. Um, and that was the time that, you know, after being in Chicago a while, um, I decided I wanted to actually move to California because that was the only place I was doing jujitsu. And, and I knew Hicks and Gracie was out there and stuff. And as I was in Japan, they had that Japanese wrestler challenge him in um, California. I forgot his name, but it's on the internet. He challenged him at the gym and he got beat up. And, you know, then I think even when I was in Japan, Hickson fought that one tournament. The Yoji Yes. Um, he fought in that tournament. I think uh, that guy from Holland fought in that tournament. The, the bobsledder from the U.S. did. And Hickson Gracie won the tournament. And you so I was there. Happened at Valley Tudo Japan '94. Where? Yeah, you, I was there from '94 to '95, I believe. Did you see it? Did you see that tournament live? Or did you just watch no, it? I didn't see that, but I was there where Duke Rufus fought um, Kitsongret, Chongpet Kitsongret, or whatever that Thai boxer. I was there for that. I no, 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 not for that one. Not for that. That was Rick Rufus. No, I was there when uh, Duke Rufus fought Andy Hoog. From Ooh. Sweden, I think. Okay, yeah. So I was there for that one because um, I went there and I, I, you know, I fought on some of those undercards and and things like that. So I was there for that turn, that fight. Um, cool. But it was one of those situations that I was kind of like just in the background and seeing like kind of the birth of MMA on that end and how it when I was coming back it started like growing locally with like you know Chicago Challenge or whatever they called it or. Um, so then when I came back, I want to do more ground. And, and this was like in January, February of 90. No, I forgot when that was. Right around there, maybe. Um, I decided I want to move to uh, California to learn jujitsu. So I packed up everything in my uh, car, everything I had. And I was going to drive out to California. Well, as I was driving out there, I hit like it was a big snowstorm. And... You know, I was going to drive out to my sister. She was living in Coralville, Iowa, right by uh, Iowa City. And my other sister was actually living in California. And she said, why don't you just stay there? If you come out here, you're going to have to work a lot and stuff. Can't you find another gym out there? I said, well, I'm in Iowa right now. I know Pat Militich was there. I'll look into that. Um, but I said, I actually, so I went and I found Pat Militich and I wanted to train with him. And I think I think they thought I was like, oh, he's with Matsumoto, because I think they set up Pat versus Matsumoto like a super fight in Iowa. Um, so I said, no, I just want to train. I mean, my goal is to go out to California, but I was going to train there while I was there. So I started training with them. Um, and then I said, well, you know, my sister in California, I said, look, I want to come out there. I want to train at Hicks and Gracie's gym. Right. So like I flew in, it was like a July 4th weekend. And I got like a lay, layover in 
Vegas was like delayed or something. I finally got in California. It was like eight in the morning. And she goes, well, I called them at Hicks and Gracie's. And I said that you wanted to train jujitsu. And they said, well, if he wants to take classes, he's got to go to Torrance. And the way my sister worded it, she goes, no, he doesn't want to train. He just wants to fight you. And I'm like, how can you say that? She's like, no, no, they'll understand. No, I said, no, they're going to think I want to fight you. No, Dave, they won't. And I'm like, whatever. So I actually went there and I said, hey, my sister called. And he goes, oh, you're the guy that wants to fight us. I said, no, no. It was like a July 4th, like that, that <laughs> weekend or something. And there was like nobody there. And the guy goes, well, go, go get your gi on. And I said, well, well we, we don't practice with gis. And he's like, how do you do jujitsu without gis? I'm like, I don't know. We just grapple. He goes, well, here, at least you have to wear pants. And my first thought, it was like, because of cleanliness or something. I didn't know. But I realized how much more you can pass the guard with gi pants on without the guard. And like it's a whole different game. So I actually, you know, they brought out one of their, their instructors or something to roll with me. And, you know, he was he had a hard time beating me. And I didn't, like I said, I only been training jujitsu a little bit, but I had a good base from wrestling and things like that. So I was able to at least, and I, I never rolled to beat anybody. I rolled to learn. So I was actually doing that. And it took about 20, 15, 20 minutes before the guy first tapped me. And the guy came out and he goes, oh, my gosh, you're really good at this. You know, you're, you're Oompa and you're escaping. I'm like, yeah, I don't even know what I'm doing half the time. And he goes, well, how do you do out in Iowa? I said, oh, those guys beat me all the time. I didn't want to kind of sound humble. Well, the guy got pissed. He's like, all right, let's go again. I'm like, all right. And he threw me in a headlock. And I'm like, all right, maybe he knows something I don't know. But I actually escaped and, and kind of did well, like I said. And I wasn't trying to beat anybody or anything. And the next thing you know, it was like the whole gym started getting people lined up and were kind of watching us. I don't know where they came from. And different people just start rolling with me. And, you know, I mean, it's like fresh meat and stuff like that. So I rolled probably about two or three hours that day, just like nonstop. I mean, it was it was a, such a good learning experience. I learned a lot um, because, you know, where we trained in Iowa was almost off videos and trying new things and stuff like that. But they were like way ahead of the game out there. So um, that's when I really got, and I came back. I said, "You guys, we got to train different in jujitsu. They're they're doing different things. They're not so basic and and things like that." So that's how I kind of got with Patton, and the whole birth of the MMA started. So now the Matsumoto fight with Pat. Obviously, they when they rematch, you fought. Uh, it looks like was your uh, was your first or second fight with Travis Fulton. That was my second fight. It was the first fight. It was uh, GG or CC Sierra, GC Sierra. Okay. That was a fight. That was the Matsumoto fight that I fought. And that was the one I'd only been training at Pats a month or two or whatever it was, maybe three months. And that's when they fought. And that was the first time I seen Matsumoto in a while. And, and you know, Matsumoto, he was, you know, courteous to me and stuff like that didn't say anything bad and i've seen some of the old students and stuff like that so um but i think pat beat him with a tko or something like that after 20 minutes or whatever it was but again matsumoto was matsumoto just kind of like always there not explosive but just never quitting or anything like that so it was a it was a good fight but you know yeah you know, but you fought what i'm getting to, to the point though is like for the early going here and as we go through here you fought uh you know I mentioned Travis Fulton there on that second show. Then you went on to the extreme. You fought on Monty Cox's very first extreme challenge. Yeah. Rolando Higueros. What do you remember about the first extreme? Uh, that was out in, um, I think it was in Iowa City. Was it Ames, Iowa? or? Okay, let me check. I remember. Cause cause that was... Yeah, go ahead. That was what they called, I think, uh, Pat Miltich's versus the uh, Midwest All Stars, I believe, or something like that. It was in, okay. um, it's a pretty big barn place where I think they had like the state championships for wrestling or something like that. Um, that was one of uh, Bob Shermer's guys. Um, and he was a tough guy. He was shorter than me and something like that. But it was one of those situations that, you know, you're, we're learning MMA and stuff like this. And he would just like wing punches. So it wasn't boxing. People were like, oh, just jabs, jab. Yeah. I'm like, you guys don't understand. It's not like you can outpoint people you got to be careful you can like land little jabs but the big punches are what's gonna hurt so that was one of the things it was a it was a tough fight he's a real good fighter 
Uh, but I was able to take him down and I landed an elbow to split him open. And after a couple of minutes, or, you know, it was a pretty long fight, but after landing that uh, elbow, I split his eye open and then um, I think they stopped it because of the cut. Yeah, you got about eight minutes in, in there. And then from there, you know, so, so what, describe the, the show, though, the first extreme challenge. I mean, did you have weigh ins? Did you have doctors, medicals? Did you have gloves? No. Um, <laughs> You know what? I I don't remember. I remember everybody could bring their own gloves and stuff like that for the first couple. And Travis Fulton, um, I think copied uh Tank Abbott. I'm not Travis Fulton, um Jeremy Horn. And what they get is those uh those black gloves from Century. I forgot what mm -hmm. they called them. They were small gloves, and they would take a, a stitch remover and remove like there's a little band here and a couple other paddings. And like cut open the middle to give you like grip on that, so to protect your hands. Most of us never even like we had like little white padding, maybe. I think maybe Monty gave us some white padding gloves, maybe on our first couple. Um, but yeah, nobody you know wrapped their hands. I remember. Um, there was actually the only, first time I remember somebody wrapping their hands was um, a guy by the name of Paul Wells. And the reason he did that is I think he broke his thumb in training. And he had like a pin sticking out of his thumb. Mm -hmm. So he, he wrapped it up. So, and he, cause I'm like, why are you fighting? He goes, this may never happen again. I want to be part of the first show or something like that. Or first couple. So he was a tough guy. Like I said, there was characters in there. And he was one of the, those tough guys that are, you know, probably didn't know what they were doing too much, but. Um, yeah. But they had the balls to get in there. Yeah. No, there were, yeah. there were a lot of those guys. So, so the next time you come out, you go to a now by Extreme Challenge Five. Monty's developing a little bit, you know. Yep. You're still in 1997, so we're in, in, in old time. But now this is you, you have a four man tournament here, and if anybody remembers the 1997 period in the Midwest, you fought two real tough guys. One was Jesse Jones, who was a Jeremy Horn student, and another guy is is the mysterious Kaz Daniels. Daniels, I I understand now. Daniels isn't even his real name. The guy had a you know, you know toured the country as a male stripper, kind of with a character and a name and stuff, and also did fighting. But uh, you know he's out there now. He's got uh, Kaz Daniels ain't his real name, but he was tough as hell. Oh yeah, no, both that was a tough fight. Um, both of those real tough fights. That was in um, was this Cedar Rapids, I believe, where we fought. Um. But yeah, that was a tough fight. I remember that. Um, I remember specifically fighting Jesse Jones because he had just beaten somebody like in 15 seconds or something. He he was a uh, one of those guys that just came out fast. Um, and I remember being on the ground and his guard, you know, just kind of like kind of the grinding him down and stuff like that, trying to pass the guard and stuff like that. I remember people like yelling, just get up and fight, get up and fight. And then I remember Pat Militich was a ref. He's like, this is fighting. He's like, no, they're not. They're just laying on each other. And, like, no, they're... and he was like arguing with the, the members of the crowd. So those a lot of those early fights, I remember crowd people kind of booing and stuff like that and, and not, not really understanding what was going on. So, you know, they were learning just as much as those fighters were learning. But, yeah, that was a, that was a tough tournament. Yeah, for sure. What, uh, what was your impression of uh, the organization? Was it getting better? Was it getting more organized? Because uh, Monty's a guy – that, you know, it was always doing little things, but still, that's, you know, those were chaotic days. Um, No, Monty, Monty had, like, experience, because I believe he, he promoted, I think, Hector Camacho or something in a boxing match in Iowa, you know, so he knew how to have a bigger one and things like that. So, um, and I think he followed um, Tom Latuli's lead, because he went out there and he realized, hey, this is, like, the, the, the next part of it, because Chicago's having some big fights, and and he knew he could sell, um, I think, the Quad City Coliseum or whatever they called it with the with the Quad okay. City Thunder Plate and stuff like that. That was uh, – so he kind of knew how to run that, and he'd done that before. I think he also did, like, a pro wrestling promotion. So he's done promotions before. So it's just – he knew how to run a promotion, just the sport became different. All right, so now let me ask you: How did you settle in Milwaukee? Because it's and and, and tell the story about how you left Milton's because I always found that to be funny. Um, well, what happened was before I went out there, um, I'd been working in a nursing home, and that's where I met my now ex fiance. Um, in a nursing home, she she was a, a nurse, and 
I was just, I don't know, it was in a social work department or something like that. Um, and we met and that's where um, we decided to get married and stuff like that. Um, after I, and I said, well, I'm going to move out to California first or something. And then I got stuck in Iowa and she, I think, went down to Florida for a little bit, but then came back and work, was in um, Westmont, Illinois. And that's where we decided to get married. And I really wanted her to move to Iowa so I could continue to train and stuff. But she wanted me to move to Illinois because she really liked Illinois and she had some of her classmates there. Um, so we decided to move to Kenosha, or Kenosha, Wisconsin. So neither of us would be happy. So that's that's how we decided <laughs> to move to uh, Wisconsin. That's a good decision. That's a good decision. Now in Wisconsin, the, the, the one of the things we already touched on is that in the early going, you had some tough experience. Obviously, exposed to military and stuff, big stuff. You know, Matsumoto taking you to Japan and stuff. Then your fights with Daniels. And Jones is tough stuff. Now, how did the rivalry with Adrian Serrano go? And where, where's Serrano? Uh, you know, because Adrian is from Milwaukee, and he was a guy who was definitely already a veteran. You were the young guy coming up. So talk, talk about Serrano and how that became a rivalry for you. Um, well, the first time we fought was out in Iowa. Um, I think it was Des Moines, Iowa, we fought in, in like a bar, big frog bar or something like that. Um so that was the first time we fought, and it was a draw. I mean, he won that fight. It wasn't it wasn't a real draw. I mean, but back then there was like I don't know, fifteen minute time limits, and after that, if nobody won, it was called a draw. But I mean, he won that one. I I didn't know exactly how to train yet, and and you know, we're new at the whole conditioning and how to do this, and quote unquote the point system or whatever. So it was you know it was a growing and Monty wanted to do a fight here, and I'd moved to uh, Kenosha. And that's when he promoted the fight here at the broad stop. And that's where I had my second fight with him. Um, the second fight was really close. It was one of those that I believe I won that fight, but it was close that I could see either of us being called for the winner and stuff like that. Um, again, you know, it's kind of like subjective on who won and stuff like that. And there was a decision either way. So that's how that got started. Um, and then, you know, when I, when I start promoting it, I, I knew that he was a big draw. So, I promoted some shows with him as a one of the headliners just to kind of like build on the shows that I would be doing. All right, so th there wasn't any real bad blood. It was just the kind of thing that you don't really like to lose. So, you you know, you kind of, you know, didn't like him for a little bit, but then later on you work with him and stuff like that. That's that's cool. That's all right. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't dislike anybody, but I do know that conflict sells tickets. And if I can create some kind of conflict and people are like, oh, you know, there's some conflict, I'll I'll do it. I mean, I, I know how the game is played and stuff like that and, and what people like, you know, like kind of a storyline behind the story. Um so yeah, there was no bad blood or nothing like that. So now as, as we go forward here, it looks like you finally got out to California for some fights uh in a neutral ground show. Yep. So now one of the guys on there is another guy like yourself that, you know, put two decades into their careers, a guy named Toby Amato. What do you remember about that fight, Neutral Grounds 12? Um, first of all, the first thing I remember, rather, what is it? It's Neutral Grounds 13, rather. Okay. The one thing I remember about that fight more than anything was that I think we started at like five or six in the afternoon and we didn't end till like midnight. And I fought okay. twice and I fought some guy. One of those guys like probably watching the UFC and stuff like that. They called it Thug Jiu Jitsu or something like that. I think their team name was or something like that. Um, yeah. And so I beat him. And then I think I fought maybe like three, four, five hours. It was a long time. I wish I had a timestamp. But I remember almost like taking a nap and being tired. And then when I was up, I remember that it probably being about 32 degrees. Like, it was so cold when I was supposed to fight. So I was getting in the ring. Um, and and we, we had to leave. Where, wherever we had to warm, it was like a pavilion. And it was probably about a half a mile walk. And actually, when I Jeremy goes, hey, they have a car that can drive you or something. I said, no, I got to get warmed up. Let's just walk. So we walked there, and I think Jens Pulver was the guy that asked me for a ride. He goes, hey, you need a ride? I said, no, I'm okay. So I was like, the first time I met Jens Pulver, um, you know, you, you meet people down the road. It's just just little happenstance. You meet little person here. 
And I think that was the one that I met, um, I think, uh, Mask. Mask came to that one or Rome, Georgia, when I fought down there. Um, so it was like little times like that, you start meeting people. But I remember about that fight was getting in the ring, right? They, they announced me. And then there was a fight before me, and I think it was with uh, one of the Gracies. I don't know if it was Henzel Gracie's student or something. They started yelling at me for being in the ring because they first wanted to announce their fighter as a winner of the tournament because they didn't have a match. I'm like, look, I'm just trying to stay here. So I was like standing underneath one of those lights to try to get warm because it was so cold and I didn't even have like a, a sweatshirt on because I was like all warmed up. So I just remember it being so cold. And then um, that was probably the fight that I had one of the best arm bars I had in, in, from the bottom. I had one of those beautiful arm bars I just spun and then he like face planted and I hipped out. So it was a, one of the best arm bars I had. That's cool. He's a tough guy. You know, obviously later on down the line, you've seen the submission he pulled off on Masvidal, yeah. right? No, he, yeah, he was very, I mean, that's the thing. They were usually back then, if people were fighting, they, they were good. You know, here, I mean, we still have real high level guys, but when there's so many guys fighting now, you, you kind of run into guys that aren't that good. So, but no, he was really good. I mean, and Kaz Daniels is probably my other arm bar, but that was from his back that I hit a really nice arm bar. Yeah. Now, how was this trip to California? Like, how did you get the fight? How did that get arranged? I see Serrano was out there. Hover may have been with Jeremy Horn at that point. Horn was the main event. Are you fitting in with these Midwest guys, or like? Yeah, I I went out there because I was living in Kenosha here, and I went out there. I think I had to drive out to Iowa to fly out of because that's where they bought my ticket or something like that. I just remember that I had to fly out there to to do that. But no, I actually roomed with Jeremy Horn. I I cornered him, um, and I, what I remember that he fought John March. Yeah, and and John Marsh was on top the whole time. They were right by our face, and he was like, I mean, we didn't know like, if you think about it, you're gonna like if the top guy's on top, he's gonna win. So it looked like he was beating Jeremy Horn. So he was right by the cage, and I just remember, like like making fun of him like john john's not even punching he's afraid of punching jeremy and so john would get up and start punching well that would give jeremy room to do his moves and and stuff like that so it was one of those situations that you know cornermen don't usually win fights but i think me yelling that kind of stuff i remember john like reacting to what i was saying um but i was a cornerman with uh with um monty for that and then after that he won a belt and so we were rooming together. I remember I got up in the morning because I can't sleep all the time. So I got up in the morning and I got buck naked and I took his belt that he won that night. And I put Ooh, it on and I stood over Jeremy Horn. I'm like, hey, Jeremy, see anything you like? So Yeah. That was, that, <laughs> that'll wake him up. Yeah, you're a weirdo, dude. <laughs> no, no doubt about that. I'm not going to deny that. But uh, so that, that takes me back to let's tell the story about how you got thrown out of Militich's too, because it's actually very funny. I, I didn't ever got thrown out of Militich. I, I left when I got married, but I went out there and stuff like that. I don't I don't think but that's a story. There was an incident. Which one? Wasn't uh, Pat at some point showing the gym to like a family and, and you were oh, doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that didn't get kicked me get me kicked out. Um, it was it Nick should. Tarpin because it was in Nick Tarpin's gym, and I was wrestling uh, Nate Schroeder. And when 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 we re I mean, it's one of those situations that you know Nate could be really serious, but then he could like kind of goof around. We started wrestling, and all we started doing was like pulling each other's shorts down. So we would wrestle and, and pull each other's shorts down as we we're wrestling, and then. That was when Tommy Boy was out, so we'd call each other thinners. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we were wrestling that. And then all of a sudden, Nick Tarpin comes, like, oh, this is our grappling. And it's like two guys with their shorts pulled down, just rolling on the ground. And he didn't see anything. He's a couple, like, it was like a family of four that just walked by us and they like, shook our heads. And it was, you know, boys being boys. Yeah. You know, uh, and Nate Schroeder's about 240. Yeah, no, Nate Schroeder, he was a great fighter. He actually had some of the best fights against uh, Jeremy Horn. I think they fought twice, and he just took it to Jeremy Horn, but Jeremy Horn would survive, and I think he beat him both times right at the end. 
Um, but yeah, Nate Shore was a real good fight, real good wrestler, big, um, and athletic. So, I mean, I think he became a cop in Davenport, the last I heard. That or maybe a stripper, a grappling stripper. Maybe you're mixing him up with Kaz Daniels again, man. Yeah. But, uh, well, you mentioned uh, the Going Platinum show, the, the Rome, Georgia show. Yes. And, uh, you had a real tough fight there. And I, if I remember correctly, you had a real tough experience on this night because I think you're, they, they, I don't know why, but I think they kept pushing your fight back and like you were actually the last, like after the main events. Am I wrong? Do I remember that wrong or is that right? I was, I don't know if that was a pay per view event and that's what happened, but I do know I got on the card real late. Like, Monty goes, I finally got you on his card. I'm like, what card? So I actually had to like drive out to Iowa. And then we flew from Iowa up to Minnesota, you know, the connecting flight, and then down to Rome, Georgia. And I got there like that. And I think everybody was there. And I got there that day of the weigh-ins. So I had to like hurry up and lose weight and stuff like that. Um, but I I was late. Yeah, because I was one of the – I think the last fight after me was Jens Pulver and Phil Johns because it was my fight. And I remember I think it was like two five-minute rounds only. Or something like that it was really or short, but the ring was so big it took like a minute and a half to walk from one corner just to the mm-hmm. center of the ring. It was so big, and I just remember it's like it was ours was kind of a boring fight and stuff like that. Um, and then let me let me just clear it up. It it's against Paul Rodriguez, who's a veteran, uh, you know, a lifelong martial artist at this point, like yourself, and a, a real tough guy back then. Quiet guy, didn't say much, but definitely a real tough guy. It looks like it was three four minute rounds, and if I'm not mistaken, okay, that was it. And I think I judged that fight. I don't remember. Okay, yeah, it was a boring fight. Um, and then Jens Pulver, Phil Jones, I think he knocked him out in like 15 seconds or something like that. Um, yeah. But the best part of that, because that's where uh, Pat fought Lan- uh, Paley Landy, Jose yeah. Paley Landy, and he hurt his back and stuff like that. I remember taking him in there, and I remember not having room because I was put on the card so late. So Monty goes, well, you just room with uh, Joe Slick and um, Jeremy Horn. I'm like, all right. So I had to room with them. Well, Joe Slick went out drinking or something like that. And Jeremy Horn, I said, let's just go to bed. We're tired. And then there was only two beds in our room. And so Jeremy Horn's like, well, I mean, what's going to happen is if we each pick a bed, Joe Slick's going to crawl in bed with one of us. All right. Probably wake one of us up or something like that. He'd be drunk. And he goes, or as one of us said, hey, let's just lay in bed together so Joe Slick wakes up none. So we shared a bed that night. And, of course, when Joe Slick got in there, he was drunk, and he probably, like, you know, made fun of us or turned on all the lights. So we woke up anyways. But that was a, a three-man room, so another yeah. great night. Yeah, yeah. Monty's got you full, fully accommodated there, yeah, sharing. Uh, yeah, you fought a, a, a tough guy. too. Everybody there had tough fights, though. So, yeah, no, it was a that so, um was it Brad Kohler fought. I remember this. This is and back in the day, these is how were medicals were performed. Brad Kohler fought uh Babalu, I believe, right? I'm I'm checking up on that. Uh, it's very possible it was a huge show. Yeah, Babalu and Brad Kohler, absolutely. Yes. Right. And the thing I remember about that was Brad Kohler, like, they did medicals, like the blood pressure and who knows what else. But I know they did blood pressure. And they checked him, and his blood pressure was really high. And I remember him, I don't know if he was popping something, like caffeine pills or drinking whatever, just to get pumped up for his fight with Bob. So he was all jacked up, ready to go. And I remember, I think it was two EMTs or two doctors walked in there and said, hey, we need to recheck your... uh, blood pressure so um you know because it was kind of high and he was like no i'm fine i'm fine you know and you could see he was just all jacked up and stuff like that and the doctors looked at each other and they said well if we check it and it's high we have to do something and the other doctor's like okay let's not check it and walked out so (laughs) that's how the medicals were done there i mean i know it probably does the same thing like this but i remember that specifically i'm like they're not going to check his medicals because they don't want them Tell him he can't fight. Now Brad got kicked in the head that day. Yeah, yeah, he gassed out bad, and then uh, he got punted by uh, Babalu. 
Yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's pretty funny. It's not a great thing. Oh, he, he did last, I'm sorry, 50 seconds into the second round. It's like, yeah. if he got 50 seconds, <laughs> he wasn't going to be a much, uh, much great shit. There was another one of those Midwest Outlaws on that show. It was a famous show, by the way. But uh, Horn took a loss to Rod- Rodrigo Nogueira, big knock. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people think Horn won that fight, including, I think, myself. You know, back then... There was like that, oh, my gosh, they're Brazilians. They're, you know, they're unbeatable, this and that. So if it was a close fight. You're like, well, of course you have to give it. And from what I remember from that fight, I think Jeremy Horn was on the ground, right? And Rodrigo would not get into his guard. So if you think about that in a fight like that, something like that, where, you know, they're supposed to be so good on the ground and they refuse to get into Horn's ground, I think that shows a lot of respect for Jeremy and his ground game. And he was probably the ultimate, you know, student of the game. He really was the man that studied everything. I mean, he's not the most athletic, and he knew that, but he would study everything and learn everything. And and that's what I remember about that fight was that that was a lot of respect shown for, you know, Jeremy if Rodrigo's not getting into his guard. Do I remember correctly? I think in the stand-up, like, Horn was timing a head kick and caught him a few times with it, too. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy Horn was – and he he told me that he used to do head kicks because if he misses or something, they'll end up on the ground, and that's where he wants to be. And he knew he wasn't a good takedown. He couldn't just take people down, so that's why a lot of times I think he used that head kick as part of his plan to get to the ground. You know, most people are like, oh, don't kick in the head. You might fall, and it'll be on top of you. Well, that's what he wanted. So, I mean, he knew his limitations. He was, like I said, he was playing chess while a lot of people were playing checkers. Yeah, he's a genius, man. I mean, just it just – that's that's interesting because a lot of people who have bad takedowns try their bad takedowns in fights, you know. But he, yeah. he's he, that head kick. That's a great strategy, especially for the early nineties. Now, at some point here, you know, you've beaten a long list of top guys here. At some point, you start to you know crawl into uh, you know the top ten lists on the world level and stuff like that. Um, when did you start to think about that sort of thing that you were pretty good on the world level? Um, you know, I never thought that I, I always thought, you know, just, I just like to compete. My whole idea was to compete. I didn't like to measure myself. I don't even, like, even now I don't like to think about that. Um, even like something like this, when we, when I talk like, Oh, talk about your career. I said, I don't like to talk about my career because it seems like, okay, it's over with. And I want to talk about what I was. Um, I just knew that I like to compete and, and, you know, it's something that I enjoyed. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, I, I got to do this, I got to do that. No, I just, I did it to compete. And that's why, you know, I, I never worried about, well, this will help my career. This will, this fight won't. I just took fights, you know, like the whole anywhere, anytime, anything. So even if I was injured, I took fights. So, which looking back, you're not supposed to, but, you know. Yeah, you, uh, you do. You look back, you'd probably change a few things. But now, oh, yeah. now let me, you know, at some point, like I said, you're, you're, you're one of the guys that, it's starting to come to the top and stuff. And you had like a pretty serious motorcycle accident. Why don't you tell people about that setback and, and how that, that thing, you know, affected you? This is circa 1999, right? I didn't have a motorcycle accident. Well, well, well how'd, you, how'd you hurt your neck? You know, it was probably just overuse or over time. Um, I thought it was a motorcycle accident. Why don't you clean it up? Because I know um, you're – Comeback fight, your return fight after the long layoff was Chris Lytle. So we'll we'll end, you know, talking about that fight. But why don't you take us through? You know, you're come, you you spent a year laid off. Yeah, well, I never thought myself as somebody who got injured a lot. Because, but the problem was I would be injured, but I still would fight through it. Um, and what had happened was, like, I would I would just like just even having like a. a cup of tea or something like that and i drink it if i coughed or you know, like cleared my throat my hand would go and i almost dropped the cup and i'm like i would lose like strength in my right hand even now to this day my my right hand is like my right side is weaker than my left side and you know there was a guy here was like oh you just need to re you know because i said my neck it felt like it felt like something tore inside my inside my back you know, it was just a light grapple with some new guys, and it just felt funny. And I kept feeling like something in my back. I kept itching, and I, I you know, it, it'd go numb, and and it just wasn't feeling well. So, 
I probably even fought a couple of times like that, but I just, I couldn't use my right hand or anything. And then that's where, you know, they started doing like, uh, I went to therapy, like physical therapy and stuff. And they're like, oh, is it getting better? I'm like, no, it's not. It's, you know, and they, you know, they said, well, we'll do this. And then all of a sudden I had MRI and then one doctor says, you have like a ruptured disc or something like that. You need this fixed. And that was like, well, I mean, how do you fix it? And they're like, well, we, we drill your hip, we take a bone out and we fuse your neck together. And I'm like, well, how does that like affect me as a competitor? Because at this point I'm like, you know, at least I just want to make the UFC type thing. So they fused my neck together and I was out. So I have a hole in my hip where they drilled. And this is shortly after that, they stopped doing it. They used titanium, but they just fused my neck together. And I was in a, a brace, like a neck brace for like a hard brace for three months and a soft brace for six months or something like that. So nearly a year I had a neck brace without working out or anything. Um, so, yeah, I think it was, I don't know if there's a, one situation. I know exactly when I kind of did, it was a light roll with the guy, but it wasn't anything hard. So it wasn't, it must've been just over time or something like that. I, I got that. That's amazing though. But so now they do it with titanium and you have, to, so they drill a piece of your bone out. And, and yeah. And that, they take a bone to fuse the two vertebrae together. Okay. So there's like a, a core of bone, like from my hip and then they go through the front here and they fuse my neck together. So, and they said, you know, you're not going to have, you know, my movement on my neck is not as good. And like I said, my right hand still is to this day is not strong as my left side. You know what I mean? And I'm right hand dominant. Um, like when I, you know, even like when you do like the, the grip strength and stuff, my right hand doesn't grip very hard. I can't, you know, pick up my right hand or throw my right hand with any much conviction. So it's one of those things that almost like took half my body away from me. That's and crazy. it wasn't, a, yeah, it wasn't like, like I said, it just, I guess, overuse or over time. Because I, I know almost the exact time when it happened was just a light roll. Now, when you uh, when you say fused, now, if you, you're not sure, it's, it's cool. But a lot of people have more than one bone fused. You know, do you have two or three or like what do you know? Are you familiar yeah. with those? I believe they just fuse like C5, C6. I believe my, my ex fiance would know. Um, I think they only fuse one of those bones, but they said the the disc on top is going to get worn and the disc on bottom are going to get worn just because I don't have the, the same kind of movement in my neck and my head. Um, and that's why sometimes you see me, I, I turn funny. I can't you know, touch my my chin down to my neck. I can't look up as well. You know, I mean, it it limits me. And this is, you know, I was I was a young guy when this happened. I think it was 28, 29 when I think I got fused. You know, and um, even, to be honest with you, even in your le later career when you, because you, you fought a lot afterwards and at a very high level, but even then, you know, like, I mean, you know, we're friends. I mean, it's like, you know, you had movement, man. Carl dropped you with, you know, you got... Or Rami Aram, I think, dropped you with like one, you know, that's not yeah. you. You don't look like that. So, like, it affected you your whole career. Yeah, no, it was. And that was the one thing. If you ever look at my right hand, I would I would throw it. But I, I knew I wasn't going to try to hit anybody. It's almost like a throw to get to the clinch. I mean, kind of like talk to Jeremy Horn. I would get into the clinch. I was really good at the clinch. You know what I mean? And that's what I'd get into that. And I would throw that not to hit somebody or even knock it out. But. You know, because I used to have, I mean, when I boxed, I was, I could punch. But when I got in there with that hand, or I broke my hand too. But with the neck, I it, I mean, even like baseball, I think when I was 27, 28, when it, whenever I got fused together, my brother and I, we went to, like, you know, state fair or something. He was probably like 12 years old and he could throw the baseball faster than me. And it was like my arm would hurt. I couldn't throw it. It was like so weak. But, you know, it, it probably did affect me a lot more than I thought, you know. Yeah. Now, at some point, though, you you, you, you even with the braces and shit, you didn't give up. You said you were going to come back and compete because you did. Um, yes. How did that come about? Because those those uh, Randy Greenman shows in, in, in St. Louis or in, in the boondocks there in Missouri – are legendary shows, and he put together massive fights, including your return fight against Chris Lytle, two UFC level dudes. Yeah, no, um, that was those ones that just called me up, and I said, "Yeah, I'll do it." And you know, 
I actually think I promoted a show like a day or two after. I think it was on a Thursday night, and I might have done a show after that. So I was, you know, I also knew as a businessman, I knew that, you know, you can you can promote a lot longer than you can fight. You know, I, I learned that from watching like people like Monty Cox and other like Tom Latuli and stuff like that. You can promote a lot longer than you can fight. Your fighting career is a very short window. Um, so that's why I started like, well, you know, I need training partners here in Kenosha as well as like a business model. And and thinking about that, you know, the training partners would come from guys who would compete. And I think comp- competing makes the best fighters. You know, training is great and stuff like that. But the more they compete, I think the better they get at it. Um, and I think Jeremy Horn's a perfect example. I mean, he traveled around the country, you know, two, three fights a night. I remember he'd he'd be able to drive somewhere and get a fight on a Friday night, drive somewhere else and get a Saturday night, you know, like small little shows. And it wasn't like high level competitions, but just getting into the ring and doing things that you want to test out, you know, opponent that's not a training partner and a, a under live fire, I think made Jeremy Horn one of the best fighters ever through a process of evolution, not just because he trained a lot, but he competed a lot, and I think that made him. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And you guys, from all that, I was going to ask you, was it around this time with the injury, too, that you became uh, Freestyle, you know, Academy and, and the Freestyle Combat Championships and stuff? Talk about the evolution of that, because, you know, a lot of the guys from the next year after you, you were affected by you and your group, you either as, as competition or, or you had a, you had a strong group there. Yeah. Um, so as I was, I was still in my neck brace and stuff like that. I remember Brett Alazawi came and wanted to live and train here. So he came and lived with us for a while to train. Uh, he was kind of upset because I couldn't train with him. I said, look, I got my neck like this. Um, and like even like sleeping, I had to like sleep sitting up sometimes like in a, a papasan chair because, you know, I couldn't lay my head back and stuff like that. But he trained. And that's where I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to start promoting shows to get more fighters to fights. And I actually promoted some in like uh, here in Kenosha, I promoted some as well as in uh, Twin Lakes, Wisconsin. And then I, I moved up to uh, Racine, Wisconsin, and started promoting shows up there. So that's when we did the Freestyle Combat Challenge, we called it. And we call it Extreme Brawl. First time I had a partner, John Principe and stuff like that. Um, we started that way. And then I kind of um, went another way and got this Freestyle Combat Challenge and with grappling matches and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, that was when, you know, I started promoting and realizing that, you know, my, my career is going to be short ended, especially with this major injury and stuff like that. And so that's why I started promoting more. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of like doctors in the area that were really big in the USC to back us, Dr. Maine, Dr. Walrod, um, you know, Dr. Passarelli and stuff like that. So we had a really good support system. Um, and it, it just grew from there and got really big. And it was probably, the, you know, one of the premier places. Like, we used to go take on uh, American Top Team. We'd bring them up or go down there with them. So that's yeah. when, the you know, but it started out small and just kind of feeling it out and, and going from there. Now, now, let me ask you, and we'll go back around. We don't need to go completely in order. But at the end, you, you, you know, it got big, the freestyle – and then all of a sudden you had a guy you mentioned earlier in this interview start popping up in the area, another big school, Duke Rufus, and, you know, stuff like that. And that became a rivalry, too. We talk about that and the influence. And then also, you know, the uh, the, the boxing commissions. Um, yeah, Duke Rufus uh, came to one of my shows and stuff like that. And then, you know, he's a, him being a business person said, hey, you know, this is the way to make money and stuff like that. So. Because he used to do kickboxing shows, and then he'd do kickboxing shows, and he'd add one or two uh, mixed martial art fights on it. Um, so he kind of introduced it that way, and now you know he he did that um, for a while, you know. And for a while, Wisconsin. This is why I was so against this whole boxing commission coming in there. Wisconsin, you could have a fight in Kenosha, in Racine, in Milwaukee, in Green Bay in uh, lacrosse all across the state and it wasn't affected nobody was affected or anything like that once a boxing commission came i think they they wanted a limit no you can only have one event per weekend or something because they need the commissioners there and you need licensed judges and refs it's like 
it kind of ruined it for all these smaller shows. And, and that's where I think Wisconsin for a while was the hotbed. I mean, we had guys from Madison making the, uh, the fights and stuff like that. I mean, Red Schaefer was from up in um, Fond du Lac. I think he started, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, they, that was the golden age of MMA here. I mean, we had, you know, I think we had a, one time we had like eight guys from our gym in the UFC or, uh, WEC, which was a big one back then too. Um, you know, we had a, a really good team and once the commission came in, I knew it just kind of crush everything. So. so you blame, do you blame the commissioners more now? What was the rivalry with Duke? Cause I know that like, you know, that it was you, were you just being grumpy or, or, or was there something, you know, to it? No, it's, it's not a case of being grumpy and that's the, you know, people always say, oh, it's like, you know, feeling bad. But the thing about that was Duke Rufus was going to be in the back pocket with the, the boxing commission. He was pushing for a commission. And he said, oh, no, it's good. This is going to be good. This is going to be good. It's not going to be good for everybody. I mean, he, you know, they always tell you, well, when a UFC comes, it generates $40 million. So they come once every five years or whatever to Milwaukee. All the money either stays with the UFC or in the Milwaukee area. You know, they're going to get Milwaukee hotels. There's going to be no stuff. And I argued, I said, look, we we did four or five shows a year here in Kenosha uh, Racine. And people would get local um, hotels. They go to local bars for the after fight party. Most were local fighters. So they got paid after that. And, you know, there was a local, you know, ho um, the local venues were making money and stuff like that. So it was all a local thing and made money. Yes, we generate probably about, I would always argue about twenty to thirty thousand dollars, depending on like after fight for the local economy. Four or five yeah. times a year. That's a hundred thousand dollars a year, roughly. Right. Now you add that, you know, like I just said, six, seven, eight different uh cities doing that. Every little city got a bump in that thing. Well, the UFC, oh, they're gonna generate five million dollars. Yeah, but everything's going with them or it's all staying in the mall here. People didn't say, oh, let's go down to Kenosha to the after fight party. No, nobody would. You know, people would go there and it'd be drained there. And that's what I argued. And I I know that, you know, Duke Rufus was kind of like probably friends with them and kind of was in the back pocket and pushing it and stuff like that. And, you know, I know businessmen have to think about their own thing. But, you know, that was the one case I think that, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's never going to say that. But that's just... You know, it's not good business for all the other fighters. You know what I mean? It's, it's. And to, it, to add to that, there's, you know, Duke, obviously, he's, he's a, got a world class gym and a world class trainer and that reputation and stuff now. And more power to him. But when he was in kickboxing, he, he really, you know, shit all over MMA, really. He, and now all of a sudden he jumps in. Is that a little part of it, too? It's like, you know, you know well, you, you know. If you get down to it, I was out there when he fought Andy Hoog in kickboxing. And I was so excited. It's awesome. Another guy. He's from Milwaukee. I'm from Milwaukee. And I met that. And I met him, like, by the Wayans. And I said, hey, I'm from Milwaukee, too. And he kind of, like, blew me off. Like, he was so much better. And I'm like, you know, you're a heavyweight. Heavyweights aren't that good. And he, Rick, Rick Rufus was a good kickboxer. He was the better of the two kickboxers. Duke wasn't a very good kickboxer. Duke was just a guy right behind people and stuff like that. So it's not like he was ever the best kickboxer. And then as far as training goes, I would argue that he's not that good of a trainer. I'm not saying that he, you can't learn stuff and stuff like that. People are going to argue and say, oh, that's just sour grapes. It's not. It's, you know what I mean? I would say Red Shaver is a much better trainer because Red Shaver was in the, 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 uh, you know, he's in there. He's fighting and stuff like that. Even if it was kickback and stuff like that, he would fight and stuff. I, you know, I mean, behind the scenes, I know, I know his reputation as a kickboxer wasn't that good. It was, yeah, not. You know, what I mean, plus well, they're heavy. That's a big conundrum in the sport because there are a lot of successful trainers. You know that you know, and Greg Jackson gets accused of that 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 are, you know. They have their level of success and they have guys that they teach or that they've trained that, you know, win championships and stuff. But there also is an undercurrent of guys that say, 
man, I, you know, they didn't fight. They never fought. And, and there is a little bit of, of that question. It's like two camps in the MMA world. Yeah. I'm, I mean, those who fought, I mean, I always take the sport of wrestling. Wrestling is a hard, hard sport. And if you're like, if you ever watch wrestling, the guys who, you know, they celebrate when they win a the gold medal, the guys take silver bronze, you know, there are times those guys are so good and they don't even medal. You know, they do those world championships and stuff. I mean, you know, Tom Erickson's a great, you know, people say, well, you were second place to Bruce Baumgartner all those years. Second place, like gold medalist, three-time gold medalist or whatever. That's, that's good. I mean, had he not been there, I mean, it's like he was Tom, that Tom good. Is probably the second greatest super heavyweight in American history behind Baumgartner, you know? Yeah, and, and that's where it's like, you know, but they know the work put in and stuff like that and that's why it's it's hard to be like it's hard to be mad at people who did it and never made it top you know what i mean there are so many good fighters that you know especially when you look at from like lightweight to 170 and stuff like that which is probably a much tougher weight class than heavyweight because they had to know how to wrestle they had to know how to do jujitsu they had to know how to do striking they had to know clinch fighting they had to know all that stuff and so that's why the one thing I have about heavyweights is that they don't have to know everything. I mean, there are guys who are like, you know, I mean, I don't want to crap on people, but there was a heavyweight that was a champion for years. And I would argue that Matt Hughes could beat him. Yeah. And Matt Hughes was 170 pound champion. And I could, or even like BJ Penn probably could have beat him. And I mean, the best, you know, because that's why the, if you were a really good athlete, um, like a super athlete and stuff like that, you still had to know stuff. I mean, Laverne Clark was a super athlete. He was a great fighter. He was a great wrestler. But he had to learn the technique and stuff like that, or you'd get caught in submissions, and it showed. But if he was 260 pounds, he would have just probably walked through some of those guys. You know, if he was 6'5", 260 with that type of athleticism, and that's why it's like, you know, I said, you know, I argued that, LeBron James could have been a heavyweight for a while when there was like an unathletic heavyweight up there. And people say, oh, no, he'd have to learn this. No, he wouldn't. He's 6'8", 260, could jump and just knee in the head every time or, yeah, you know, super athletic. I mean, those are your best athletes for heavyweight are in NBA or in NFL. And, yes, they'd have to learn some technique, but it wouldn't take as many, much years to take it as – you know, being 155 or 170 or something like that. I mean, Brian yeah. Gary is one of the best fighters I've ever seen, knowing everything. And maybe he, you know, cracked the top 20 or something like that, maybe in his career, you know what I mean? And top 20, top 50, those guys are good. And that's why there's that level of respect. If you did it and even it made it up to the top 20, top 25, top 50, at that weight is good. But you, yeah. you look at heavyweights and it's like, you know that they didn't, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. Maybe they got really good punching power or good wrestler, but that's it. You know what I mean? It's not a, all of it. And that's where I think that people who didn't fight have that kind of like stigmatism that they don't kind of know how hard you really had to put in or how much you really had to know to get there. You know, and I, like I said, I don't want to sound like sour grapes and poo-hooing things, but. No, you know, in the old podcast with Chris Lytle, Lytle said the same thing. You know, heavyweights uh, is a completely different playing field. You know, first of all, they're not that deep, you know, you're the competition level, et cetera, et cetera. So you're absolutely right. Now, uh, before we, we stray a little bit, why don't we talk about one of your students that you had at the very beginning, and he was a heavyweight, and that's Ben Rothwell. He's still around. He's actually doing bare knuckle at this point. Why don't you talk about meeting a young Ben Rothwell? You know, he's uh ben came to me um i think he was like 16 or something like that saying he wanted to be the youngest fighter ever and he was pissed that vitor belfort was the youngest champion or whatever he wanted to be so that was his thing and i remember telling him okay and i i pushed i said well you got to make sure you do your schoolwork because i asked him how school's going he's like oh school's not for me it's not, i said i can't let you in here for school work. And he actually turned his schoolwork around. His mom said, I don't know what you did to him, but he's going to school. He's not acting up. So, you know, he came to me 
telling me what he wanted to do and, you know, actually being able to follow through. So he could follow through. He was a young kid and stuff like that, immature in some ways. But, you know, if he knew what he wanted to do, he could follow through. Um, but he would come to the gym and, and, and stuff like that. And, and he was, he moved well. And I always say, if you're a heavyweight, if you can move well and be athletic, you can have success in that. Um, and like I said, because heavyweights, you know what I mean? They're, they're kind of limited. I mean, um, but yeah, he was, uh, one of my students and stuff like that. Um, now Ben, you, you said he moved well. well. How big was he when he walked in there? Because he's massive. Was he already cutting down to, like, or was he over 265? I know you didn't have to cut at that point, but is he that huge at 16, 17? He probably was 240, 250 maybe. He was tall. I mean, like I said, I don't remember exactly weights. He probably didn't even have weight classes and stuff like that. Um, but he was, you know, he was somebody who moved well. He's probably about 6'4", six, 6', six, you know, whatever he is now. Maybe he's a little shorter than he grew a little bit. Um, but, yeah, he wasn't – he was big. Um, I'd guess 240, maybe 250, I guess, when he first walked in. Um and, you know, he – at first he would train well and stuff like that, but then, you know, it was one of those situations, I think that it was one of those times that I always said that you kind of have to be on your own. And he wanted me to be his only trainer and go to all his fights and only work with him. I said, you got to give these other people chances. You know I mean? You can't – I can't just work with one person right now. I'll be, oh, he's a heavyweight. He could take you. He could get you places. I'm like, you know – Short term, maybe I'm not gonna like sell myself out and and just do it for that, you know. What I mean, um, and that's why it was one of those situations he went out to Rothwell, no, no love, love, no problem, go do it. I actually wanted him to do that and because of his own fighter, and he did, you know, I mean, he started his own gym and stuff like that, so it was great. Now, the uh, you mentioned Brian Garrity, he went, uh, you know, he's another guy who fought, you know. 50 fights. I'm going to call it the half century club here, but um, his high point was uh, the UFC stuff. Why don't you talk about, you know, Brian Garrity going into the tough show and things like that and, and your influences on him. And then you had a couple other guys, I think that went to the tough show. So we'll go through some of those lists of people there that some of these characters that you had are just fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Brian Garrity came to me and he was so green that when he came to me, he had never worn a cup before. He actually was wearing the cup like backwards. <laughs> and I'm not saying like upside down, but it was like almost like an innie. <laughs> and, and it was one of those situations, I didn't know what to say because, you know, he seemed so happy to be part of our team and wrestling. And, and I, you know, I didn't know what to say. So I was just kind of putting it off and, even Nick Thompson's like, you know, Dave, you should say something. And I'm like, I'd be like, hey, buddy, buddy. And he goes, yeah, am I doing good? And it was like, he was like light up. He was so happy to be there. I'm like, I don't want to break his heart. So I just let it go. Let it, and he goes, Dave, you have to say something. And so I'd always try to go, buddy, hey, buddy, you know. And finally, I was able to say, hey, look, maybe we should try the cup the other way. And that's, you know, kind of how we first kind of got into it and, and stuff like that. So it was one of those situations that it started off kind of awkward, you know, and Nick Thompson was kind of making fun of him, but they, they kind of got along. And, and once we got the cup straightened out, I think his career kind of took off. You're fucking um, hilarious, dude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to have the editor mix in here some of your uh, technique videos with Garrity so people understand what we're talking about here. I mean, the bottom line is, is – there's a good humor in there, and, and it may not come across to everybody. So it's fucking hilarious. Um, you mentioned Nick Thompson. Now, this is a serious position here because, um, you know, as a trainer, you guys were – Nick was rising through Bodog, you know, doing well, picking up wins. And, uh, you know, we had Eddie Alvarez there as a champion. And, you know, Nick put the first loss on Eddie's record. And Nick took his belt at Bodog, and I believe that you deserve some credit for that. That there was, uh, you know, that you guys had spotted him for a few shows, and you were doing your homework and paying attention. Uh, why don't you talk about that process of Nick, you know, going from, you know, a, a you know, a guy who likes to get drunk, 
you know, before and after fights and, you know, not taking it seriously to, to a guy who beat Eddie Alvarez, a, a UFC champion. Um, well, Nick Thompson came to us through, um, cause we had Pat O'Malley and Ron Faircloth coming down from, uh, and those are two dedicated guys. They would come down there every Tuesdays and Thursdays from Madison, which is about an hour and a half drive. And they would come down there all the time. They even came down here. There was a guy from Minnesota Vikings, Corey something who died once because it was like 95 degrees. And I remember them coming to train and I remember Ben Rothwell being there and Ben's like, Hey, there's a football player that just died. You're going to have us train right now in 95 degree weather. I'm like, yeah, we're not playing football. We'll be fine. So like, and when we train, it'd be hot in there. It'd probably be like 110 degrees in there. Um, but Nick Thompson came down with him and he, he had the wrestling skills and stuff like that. Um, but you know, he didn't have the jujitsu skills or anything like that. And one of his first fights, I don't know which one was that guy from American top team. Dennis, Dustin Dennis. Yes. And, you know, they're like, well, we're going to put him against him. And be like, Dave, he's going to get killed. I'm like, no, he's going to be fine. He can defend a takedown. And so we just practice. Keep your jab out there. You're long. You're a big 170 or whatever. I think it was like 180 maybe that fight was at or whatever it was. I said, you're going to keep the jab and just focus on the jab, keeping him off. You don't worry about anything. And, and I remember because he had to cut for that fight. And I remember being down in Florida and everybody else had made weight. And you're like, Dave, Dave, uh, Nick Thompson has to make weight. And I'm like, shoot. All right. So I went to the hotel. I said, Nick, what's going on? And he was sitting there playing Madden on his PlayStation or Genesis or whatever game system it was. And he's like, Dave, I can't. I can't cut any more weight. I quit. I said, no, no, you're fine. So I got into the bathroom with him and, you know, turned the shower on to cut weight. And he cut the weight. And so, you know, he made the weight. We got in there and stuff like that. And, you know, it showed that he's got all the skills. I mean, he did things in that match that you're not supposed to. And that's the one thing that I never try to correct some fighters, even though if they did some things a little bit different. I don't remember that fight. I think Dustin got him down or something. And instead of trying to pull a guard, because I'm like, you're not going to learn how to pull a guard and work a guard against a guy who's so good in jujitsu. And I would just like, just sit up like you're doing in wrestling. And he kept doing that. And Dustin was like, kind of surprised. Like, this is not what you're supposed to do. And I'm like, well, we can't do what we're supposed to do because you do it better. And that's where, that was the one thing I let people kind of find the system. It's a martial art. You kind of have to do some things that other guys don't know, especially if they're going to be better at that. So I think that the way we train was not so much like, oh, we teach them what to do. Like, no, we don't. We let them find their way. And and that was the one thing I think that we try. I try to do with everybody. I don't say, you got to do it this way, do it this way. We give them suggestions and stuff like that, but let them kind of figure out different ways of getting out. Um, and I think, like I said, I learned a lot from Jeremy Horn that way because we said, well, what about this? And we try it. And then he goes, no, I don't like that. Or yeah, that's not a bad thing or different things like that. So we would come up with techniques and, and, and I'd always like, look, you guys are younger than me. You guys are more flexible. You guys can get away with things that I can't. So that's why the one thing that I think that we always did. And I like the term freestyle Academy because it became your jujitsu not my jujitsu yours you can do things i can i can do things you can't you know we'll give you the basic techniques but you know when you come down the funk and stuff like that um i think nick was one of those guys that kind of took it and ran and instead of just doing what we told him he kind of found his way and you know no no being, you, was, you, you just kept him at the end of the jab though and that sounds like you, you and your game plan Yes, that's exactly what it is. Keep him at the end of jab because I said he's going to have a hard time taking you down. And if he does, he's going to get tired. He doesn't know how big you are. He's not cutting. He's a walk around at 170, and that's going to wear him down, and it's going to be frustrating. And and people who end the fight, a lot of those guys who end quickly and stuff like that, end the fights quick, you know that they're not used to They're thinking, oh, my gosh, you went past the first round. I'm losing. Even if he wasn't losing, I said he's going to think he's losing if it goes past a minute or two minutes. And uh, one of the things that when I always tell those people, I said, don't ever tell a guy you're going to kill this guy, you're going to beat him. Because what happens is mentally, if you don't kill him, pretty soon they get in their head like, oh, my gosh, I'm losing. And it kind of plays games with them, even if they're winning, but not winning as convincingly or as fast as they want. 
I think that that's the one thing that, uh, you know, I don't like telling people, oh, you're going to win. It's just, I just want to get them, you know, the fighters that whatever your next move is, you know what I mean? If they take you down, what are we doing? If you take them down, what are we doing? You're just your next move. I'm not worried about, oh, they took you down. They shouldn't take you down. You should have done that. No, you just got to go on what your next move is. And so I think that's the one thing that when we worked with Thompson and stuff like that, or everybody, you know, it's just just Thompson was, you know, like, especially Eddie Alvarez, you can take him down. If he does take you down, that's going to be a load on him. Just work yourself back up. Don't worry about submitting him or anything. Just get yourself back up. These are the ways you do it. Find your way, even if it's a little funky or something. He's smaller than you, and and we knew that that would that would play a factor. How much did Thompson weigh? I, I know he made one seventy, obviously, but how much did he weigh come fight time? You know, that's a good question. I I don't know how much he cut from. Um, certain people, I don't know if they can sweat more or cut more. He could cut. I don't know exactly. You know, he would know better what he cut from. But he was a guy that would go down like from a lot of weight. And uh, Jamil Masu is another guy that could cut a lot of weight. Um, and there's some other guys that just couldn't. Like Brian Garrity, like he had to be within so many pounds, I think, fight time. He just wasn't as comfortable or didn't sweat as much or not exactly sure, you know, how it was. But he was one of those guys that didn't cut as well. Now, uh, Garrity went to the TV show. He's probably the best fighter you sent there, but you also sent a couple of other guys. I think at least uh, at least Solomon Hutcherson deserves a mention. Talk about Solomon. Um, Solo well, man. What you call it, Brian Garrity had a – because, like, we tried to, like, get in the first TV show, you know, we're filming and stuff. And I'm like, you guys, this is not the way to do it. You're saying, hey, I would bring this to – you know, they had videos of us fighting – and then they'd be like, I would be a really good asset to the thing. And it was really boring. I'm like, you guys, me filming this is just boring. We got to do something different. And Brian actually being very creative and stuff came up with this like whole storyline, how, you know, he was like getting beat up in the street and this and that. And I was like kind of interviewing him. It was real funny. He's got, and it kind of like somebody was able to piece it together. It looked really good. And that's how he got on. But Solomon Hutcherson had the best, like, to get on the show because like they're saying, Hey, we're looking for 185 pounders. And I called Solomon Hutchinson, look, they're 185 pounders. They're, they're looking for it. We need you to film something. And he was working, I think uh, doing like tarring or concrete or something. So he just came in with like his work on clothes. Like, I mean, work clothes, like, you know, dirty jeans and, and a shirt and stuff like that. So we got to film something. And it was him and Rob Roy like they were just going back at it, like just freeze down, like and then like slam each other and yell and talk to the camera and like I mean, like I said, and Solomon Hutcherson has some big wins. I think he knocked out John Fitch and it was a, a call of no contest. But he was so good at just like that freestyle rapping and talking and trash. And then you know, whatchamacallit, uh Rob Roy is trying to stay with him on that. And you know, Rob Roy was a little bit quieter and had a different sense of humor. But it was so, like, perfect. I just filmed it, didn't edit it, and I sent it in. Um, and Solomon got picked for that. And uh, like I said, he was uh, he was a good fighter. He was a good wrestler. And, and you know, he had that funky style and stuff like that. He was he was good. Him and uh, Rob Smith, probably one of the best first rounds ever we had in our show up in Racine. So. I remember uh, somebody got his back in Florida, and he did, like, a – a, f- a rolling front cartwheel with the guy on his back and stuff. So yeah, a real good athlete and a, and a natural on camera. Solomon is is a guy that uh, is definitely worthy of some remembering there. Now you mentioned Rob Roy. Now explain this because for a long time on Sure Dog, there was Rob Roy, and then there was Sharon Leggett. And now it turns out that Rob Roy is Sharon Leggett or Sharon Leggett, Rob Roy. What's the deal? (laughs) Well, where that came from, the whole thing is like he showed up. He showed up to my gym one day. I forgot why he showed up. Maybe it was because we were like he was like trading Pokemon cards or something because he was always he was always into business type stuff. And I was buying a new gym right down the street where. Um, I was going to buy the old thing and I was seeing it or something. I talked to him and I saw him and he goes, he like had a way of talking. It was kind of like a mumble type thing. 
And I, he, I said, he goes, do you wrestle? I said, yeah, we have it. He goes, well, I want to wrestle. I, I said, well, come to the gym and stuff like that. And then Brian Gary's like, hey, hey, make him wear a singlet. I'm like, all right. So he wore a singlet the first couple of times, you know what I mean? And he was a pretty good wrestler. He was kind of out of shape when he first came, but he wanted to do it. So, you know, we're kind of showing him what to do. And, and then like Tuesday, Thursdays when um, Faircloth would come down and um, Pat O'Malley from Madison, and Nick Thompson from Madison, they were coming there. And, you know, and a lot of times I don't like ask people name or I just remember it or, you know, I had to give them a nickname just because there's so many of it. And then he was grappling in Faircloth's like, hey, what's your name or something like that? And he was like grappling and he's like, just, it's Sharon, but call me Rod. And he's like, Rob? He goes, Ron. He said, Ron or Rob? And he's like, Dave, is it Ron or Rob? And I said, it's Rob Roy. Because like, you didn't know which one. So I just, it's Rob Roy. So from that moment, we just started calling him Rob Roy. Um, and then that's when later on we had um, Sergio Gomez was going to be on the tap out show where they're coming to film Sergio Gomez. And, you know, Mask was asking me, was, hey, is there another guy? We have to film another one from here. And I said, oh, just pick Rob Roy. He's kind of a character. And that's where he got into Superman Mask and kind of created Rob Roy, the, the uh, superhero and stuff like that. And I uh, kind of ran with it. Yeah, and, but his and name that's... was Sharon Reliant. Yeah, and now on Sure Dog, Sharon Leggett's record is combined with Rob Roy, but yeah, at some the point, same guy. he was booking himself with both names and stuff, and you know, he's one of those guys that was you know, exciting, he put on his little show and stuff, but he, he didn't keep a perfect record and stuff, so he might lose a fight under one name and you know, fight the next day under the next, another name, you know, yeah, that kind no, of... But he had the greatest weight cut that I've ever seen. And it was out in um, New Jersey. I don't know who he fought or who he fought in New Jersey. We had him fight out there. And he was fighting some guy. And, you know, he had a hard time cutting weight. And he, he you know, got the weight cut. And I think with his clothes on or under, he was like 0.1 or 0.2 over. And I said, hey, it's wet clothes. And you know, he's got wet underwear on, stuff like that. Can we just give it to him? Right, because you could see he was drained and stuff like that. And the guy said, "No, we can't give it to him." You know, what I mean, the, the opponent, because yeah. the, the the doctor said we can do it if you want, and the opponent said, "Nope, don't want it. He's got to cut that weight." And so those it was like those trainers and the guy sitting there. And so Rob Roy just put his stuff on and just started running around the room, and he would just stare at the guy the whole time, just, just not look away from the guy. He would run right by the guy and just stare at him. And he did that. 10, 15, just emotional, nothing. Just looked at him, got on there, made weight, left. I didn't say anything. And then while we're driving back in the thing, he started like chugging. I said, slow down, you can't. And he was just chugging, uh, what the heck was that? Um, Pedialyte or something like that. Just not, I said, you got to slow down. You know what I mean? And he gets out of the van and he just pukes like all this Pedialyte just, and it was like, it was probably glorious that he did that. But like I said, just that whole stare down while he was running, I thought was the, the best thing I've ever seen. I mean, that, that was a, that, that was against Nardu, Deborah Nardu, who yeah. uh, later on, uh, your guy Nick Aguilar avenged yeah. in, in Costa Rica when, uh, when you were playing uh, Tiger Man. Tiger Man. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Talk about your UFC experience. When when you went in there, you know, you got the call early in, in one of the early UFCs, UFC 40-something. Right uh, I'll get it right here. Yeah, UFC 44. And they, they, they pulled you in. They had a lot of Iowa guys, a lot of wrestler guys. I don't think they knew what they were getting, but they pulled you in for a fight they wanted you to lose, I think. And that was because they had an undefeated guy from California named Rami Aram that um, – had a big reputation, a king of the cage guy. Why don't you talk about how that whole fight came about and how you felt, you know, before the fight and, and then after? Um, well, for that fight, I do know that, you know, I didn't have anything scheduled and it was just hard for me to find things. I mean, I even won some tournament in Indiana and everybody on that show, and that, it was, that was where I was still getting injured and stuff like that. And I'm like, I just got to get a big fight. Just almost like legitimize my career you know what i mean 
I mean, it, big fights in the U.S. is different than like big fights on pay per view. So I remember fighting there once, and I think seven guys got fights in Japan. Monty booked seven guys from that fight, and I said, Monty, I won the tournament. How come I didn't get booked? And he goes, Oh, um, I think you won too quick, or you know, something like that. So that was one of those situations. I'm like. I got to do something, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, like I said, I have to just, I just want to make it, you know what I mean? Just making it once kind of, I think, would justify, okay, he's good, you know what I mean? Regardless yeah. of, oh, no, he won around the Midwest. Yeah, that's different than fighting internationally or on pay-per-view or UFC type thing. So that was my whole goal, to make it there. And that's why it's like, you know, once I made it there, it was almost like I didn't care about, you know, the fights anymore. I just wanted to preserve my body. But I was... I think the night I got the fight, we were down in, I don't know if I fought or not, but I was down at the hook and shoot in um in Indiana and Chris Lytle fought who's like Aaron? Aaron Riley. Aaron Riley. And I think Aaron Riley was booked to fight Romy Aaron, because I think that's what you told me. Or I remember that was with the next fight coming up, and Chris Lytle knocked him out. And then it was that moment that I think you told me or somebody told me, okay, I think you can get into UFC now. And that's where they gave me Romy Aram. And someone's like, oh, there's a big article that, you know, Romy Aram's going to fight for a title after he beats you. I'm like, well, he's got to beat me first. I know, I know, but you're 33 years old. I mean, you don't really, I mean, at that point, you know, you can't build, you know, at that age, you can't build, oh, yeah, this is a future. It's like, no, it's, you're the end type thing. So I figured when well, I'm going to go for it all, I'm going to, put everything out there um and i remember to get ready for that fight i was just training real hard real hard and one time like you know everybody was leaving and i remember like sitting there i'm like all right bye guys and i couldn't raise my right arm and i said you guys i can't raise my right arm and this one guy goes yeah you can he picked up and he pulled it up and i said yeah you can lift it but i can't and what happened was like my neck you know where it been fused and stuff i don't know if it was swelling or something it was pushing against something that i couldn't raise my hand so i had to go to a doctor and stuff and they had to like give me shots into my into my neck like i had to lay face down and they had to do like an x-ray into my back and put a shot into the disc to i guess alleviate it or keep the swelling down and it was that moment in my training that i felt i could go at a certain speed but if I went faster, like the wheels would start coming off. Like it start, you know how you have those old cars that, oh yeah, it drives fine when you're on the city street, 30, 35 miles an hour. You get on the expressway, you know, 50, 55, it's okay. Anything like that, it feels like it's going to fall apart. And mm -hmm. I felt that with my body that I could go at a certain pace or a certain thing, but I had to stop because if I went any longer, it would just fall apart. And that's where it was one of those situations that I, you know, I knew I had to get ready, I had to do this. And, you know, you know, knowing my neck injury and stuff, I said, well, I got to do it. You know what I mean? And it was one of those situations. I was in good shape and stuff like that, but I knew I couldn't go at the pace I wanted to. So build up to that fight was, you know, everyone's like, oh, my gosh, Dave, they think they're going to beat you. I'm like, I don't care. I'm doing it. I'm going to go out. Um, and that was the the fight that I, I, you know, I did it. So, Yeah. Now he dropped you in the in the first minute, like, and, and I remember that you smiled at him when you got up. To talk talk about your memory of the actual in ring stuff. Um, I remember Joe Silva called me, and this is the whole beginning of the UFC. It still wasn't quote unquote mainstream. They wanted to make it exciting, and Joe Silva had called me up. That was a matchmaker and stuff. He goes, "We're giving you this fight, but if you make it boring." even if you win, we're never having you on again or any of your, it's just something like never have any of your guys. So I'm like, all right, I got to keep standing. I have to stand the whole time. That's my whole idea is that I'm going to stand with them. And so if you, when I was doing that, what happened was he threw a punch and I was backing away. Like, like I didn't get caught flush with that right hand. I, I was backing away from it, but my right foot caught the mat and that's what kind of dropped me. So it wasn't like a hard, and I went down and I just kind of like, you know what I mean? I'm like, it's nothing. And then all of a sudden he started like, you know, laying all these punches and they weren't landing or nothing. And that's why I'm like, I have to do something. So I went for an arm bar, if you remember, and he got pulled out and I just kind of rolled out and got up. 
I'm like, all right, no big deal. I'm back to my feet. And that's when I like shot in that one time. And he is a big guy. I didn't realize how big he was. I mean, I don't know what he cut from, but he was just a big guy. Like, so then I'm kind of, I'm like, all right, I got to do something else and just shoot and take him down. And that's where I threw that right hand. If you remember the fight, through the right hand, understanding I'm just going to kind of like back. And I caught his neck and I like, like did a duck under swing to his back. Just because this is one of those things that I like to do. And I swung and it like took him down. And I went right into the mount off the, the, the thing. So I like threw my feet knowing exactly what I was trying to do. And then that's when I got on the mount, ran some punches, you know, he could jujitsu and stuff like that. So he got up. So just new punching. I, I just had to punch. I wasn't going for like a ground out and ground and pound. So it was like, you know, we get up and stuff like that. And I think he threw a right hand and he didn't punch hard. He went, he was tired from his first thing. I knew that, but he never was a hard puncher. So I wasn't worried. So when he did hit me that once, that's when I did, oh, okay, come on, I'm okay. But again, I could throw a jab or a right hand really light. I couldn't throw the big right hand. And that's why was one of those things like, oh, you didn't punch hard. You, I'm like, I used to be able to punch hard, but I broke my hand. I actually broke my hand when I was supposed to fight Adrian Serrano again. I was training for Militich. I actually broke my hand, and I have two plates and 16 screws in the one hand, my right hand. That's why I can't <laughs> – that was the one time – they said, okay, we fixed it. You break it again. We'll never be able to fix it again because you can't. And that's why I never want to throw my right hand either. Another reason. Um, so it was one of those things that I never punch with my right hand that hard because I knew if I break it, I never use it. So, um, but that was the thing. I, I won that decision and stuff like that. And that was the one that um, we were the, what do they call it? The swing bout or something like that. Yeah everybody's got their time but if it ends early or something like that they're gonna stick us in and so we had we were like warming up probably for like two hours because you had to be ready they could say you're up next so we we're constantly just light warming up and stuff like that and all of a sudden okay you're up you're up and then when they call us out there i was supposed to go first but Romy arrow so they introduced him as dave strasser and me as Romy arrow um <laughs> But it was one of those situations that I was like, you know, and I, I, I knew nothing was going to bother me because people, you know, I think somebody was in my corner, Pat O'Malley or someone was like, it's not, this is day's trial. I'm like, don't worry. Who cares what they announce us? We're out there, we're going to fight. So, yeah. and then afterwards, if you saw us, that was when Pat O'Malley made me do the shocker. So I was doing a shocker on pay-per-view TV, but I guess I did it wrong. Yeah, that would be you. But uh, so now you had a nice win. You know, and I remember Joe Rogan saying, you know, how tough you are and stuff like that. So you made a good impression on on the general public and stuff. They bring you back to fight Caro. And now this this isn't an easy fight. And then you never come back to the UFC. Talk about that whole experience. Um, well, the thing about that, if you remember the fight with Romy Aram, in the middle of the second or third round, I like stepped back funny. And even Joe Rogan, like Joe Rogan said, oh, wait, what happened? What happened? It was either Joe Rogan or Phil Baroni. I think that's who the announcers were. They said, oh, I think he's hurt. I think he's hurt because I stepped funny. And you know what I mean? Because I, like, leaned back or, like, I had, a, like, a weird thing. And I remember it was between the second and third round. I was sitting in a corner, and the doctor or corner person came up to me and said, how's your knee? And my one knee I had, like, I had pads on both knees because my left knee was, like, I had two surgeries on it. So I was kind of acting up. I said, my knee's fine. And the guy grabs my right knee. He goes, no, this one. And I thought it was like the weirdest thing. I'm like, why is he asking me this? I mean, like right in the middle of the fight. I'm like, no, I'm fine. But what happened was that's where I think this whole hip problem I have now kind of started. Because it was after that that I would like, like have hip pain. Like it was almost like in the middle of my thigh, not like my hip hip. But it was like the middle of my thigh. And I couldn't like like run as hard as I wanted to because it was just some kind of like pain cut. So going into the fight with Carl, like my it was only like six months later or something like that. It wasn't that long. My leg was killing me. Like I couldn't run. I couldn't do it. So I did more lifting and stuff like that. And I actually had a harder time cutting weight because I couldn't run. Um and then it was at that point in my career that you know, remember my whole goal was just to make it to the UFC. And, you know, get to that point, 
that was that was my kind of my goal. You know, I was 34, I think, when I fought Carl. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I made it, but it's like, okay, let's just see how far this runs. But then again, once you you get in your head, okay, you made that. I didn't train as much, and my fear was to get thrown on my head. That was my whole fear because of my neck and my leg was hurt. And I remember that, and it was like, gosh, they're giving me a guy to, that's going to throw me on my head. I know he's he's that good at judo, and it was almost like I fought real cautiously. And I, def you know, I, I can defend judo throws. I can do it, but it was like I was so scared that I remember I stopped it the first time. And then if you remember the fight, I like had the worst shot ever. I just shot in, and like without even trying to get in because I didn't want to like shoot in or anything like that. Hurt my neck. And I pulled guard, and he went for an ankle lock. I got out of that. We got back to our feet, and that's when he hit the first throw. And that's when I landed right on my head, and I'm like, exactly what I didn't want to happen. That was the one thing I didn't want. I just remember that. And after that, I'm like, gosh, I just don't want to get caught again or something like that. And then he caught me on that arm bar. Though. And like I said, it was at the end of the fight. It was He didn't have my head held down. I could have sat up and done other things. But the whole idea was like, you know what? I'm not injured. You know what I mean? I don't want to get injured. That was, that was a whole idea. And that's where it's like, I think I fought with a different mindset. I didn't want to, I didn't care about the winning at all costs. It was almost like self-preservation type thing. Now here's, here's the thing though. You know, you're 34 years old. You're being realistic. You know, you got to the UFC. It's kind of what the goal was. You wanted to do that. And you know, the Carl lost. Now you're out of the UFC. Now a lot of people would have called it quits there. But, you know, you you continue to fight. The The fact of the matter is, at the very least, your next four fights are all against UFC-level people, you know. Um, Ansar Chalangov in Russia, a lot of people won't remember him, but he was, you know, one of those leg lock specialists. And Pat Healy, who did the UFC. After that, the next fight, George St. Pierre, only, you know, a lot of people's choice for GOAT. It's like, that's that's... You know that doesn't sound like you got you. You were like, well, I made the UFC. I've done what I wanted to do. That sounded like you were still pursuing something. What What was your mindset after the UFC? Um, you know, I I still like the idea of competing. I really did like fighting and stuff like that. I knew like the self preservation, but I also thought that this was a way of getting into new shows. And if I can get out there, then my 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 students and my other fighters behind me. Could get if I show up there and do that. Hey, we got other guys and get them into different shows and stuff like that. So I idea was like, you know, you kind of want to keep your dream alive type thing. Um, but then again, you're like, you know what? I mean, this if this opens up doors for other fighters and stuff like that. That as a business decision, I think that I also looked at it that way. So it wasn't so much like, hey, you know, I mean, I was in good shape and, and stuff like that. But it was like one of those situations that, um. The one fight, I had a fight in Russia. Remember that one? I hurt my rib like the week or two weeks before. So I was fighting, was it Islam or something like that, his name? And that fight right there was the one that kind of really realized, wait a minute, you know, we can do what we want, but certain things, you know, I mean, it wasn't even a close fight. That was one of those things. And it was a 10 minute fight. And then we had uh, that one guy in the corner. Who's in the corner? He was a, he was a ref for Kimbo Slice's um, fight. Troy. He lost. Troy. Troy is my corner. And I was like, oh, Dave, they're calling for the, the overtime. I said, I thought after 10 minutes, whoever was win, it's ended. And they're like, no, no, they're going to call it a draw. I'm like, why? It wasn't even close. So that's why when we fought again and he, he'd gone through some, he went through, he went through two head throws and I just went with it just because my ribs were hurting so bad and I couldn't fight it, you know? And that was like, well, they gave us a draw afterwards. And I'm like, what is the point of fighting for a draw when it wasn't a draw the first time? And it's like, you know, I mean, that it was something like that. I was like, you know, that's just like, well, you're not going to win a decision in these countries or these other shows. So then like, you know, Ansar and um, those other fights, it's going to be hard to, like, grind out victory. So it was almost like, you know, I'm going to go for a first round. If I, I get caught, I get caught. If I win, I win. So well, it was one of those situations. But, but the Ansar fight, because, yeah, Ansar caught you quickly. 
I think that's a sign of respect too. You know, I, I think he was a little worried and he got a chance and he took it, but um, I don't, you, he was heavy and, and he was not yeah. playing. Wait, there was a whole, they played the shuck and jive. I, I think back about that. And usually, you know, and I think after that too, you became a lot tougher on, on making sure your opponent made weight and stuff, but they, they were very elusive on Chalangov's weight. Yeah, he and I said that that he wasn't because I remember weighing in and I was under like five pounds. I said, No, it's not. And then all of a sudden I said, Oh, he's right on. I said, Let me see. And they did it. And I'm like, No. And I remember telling you guys, I said, He was not on weight. That scale is way off. If he's on weight, he's over 10 pounds, yeah. seven or five kilos or whatever it was. And I said, There's no way I'm underweight and stuff like that. So yeah, he was bigger. And I even said that. And then he was overweight against uh, Nick Thompson when they fought. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Nick Thompson was a bigger guy, so, I mean, they took the fight, but he was a big guy, and he was strong, and it was like, at that stage, you know what I mean? It's like, you know I mean? I haven't, I haven't my business is doing well. My yeah. career has been good, so it was one of those things that I took fights that, you yeah, know, no, had you, like... Well, shit, you're not making a ton of money, and they're going to dick you at the weigh-ins. Hey, you know, they, yeah. they got they got what their, their money's worth. I, I understand. But, yeah. um... You know, and here's the, anybody who does the your your guys Pat O'Malley and Ron Faircloth started around this time the um, the Madtown Throwdown, and uh, you were the main event of the first one against Pat Healy. Yeah. You know, Pat Healy from the Fighting Healy Brothers out there from Oregon. This is another you know half century club guy. You know, tons of fights. What was that fight like? Uh, he is top. I mean, that was like. Yeah, I'll do this for you. Because we need a big name. We I'm like, fine, I'll do it. Um, and I actually didn't fight for money for him. I fought for the ring. They let me keep the ring that they used or something like that. So they bought a ring for me, uh, which is in the Waukegan gym. But it was one of those situations. I'm like, fine, I'll do it. And that's when, I don't know how long it goes, but my rib got hurt again. And I remember, I'm like, shoot. So, you know, he was on top of me or he got my back. And, you know, I fought through that. And. And I'm like, gosh, my rib is killing me and stuff like that. So I used to, I just took him down and just pounded on his his body, right? And uh, then after the second round, Brian Garrity runs in and picks me up and carries me. I'm like, there's one round to go. And he goes, oh, I thought that was it. I said, no, there's one. So I went and I actually caught him in an Uma Plata. And I remember somebody came, oh my gosh, I've never seen an Uma Plata in an MMA match. Um, but, you know, so people can like, you know, from my bottom, I, I had good jujitsu skills. People don't understand that. Um, but it was he was a tough guy. I mean, um now the next fight after that too, and then, yeah, Pat Healy's a guy who doesn't get enough respect in my book, but and then the next the guy after that is, you know, all time great George St. Pierre. And again, I think it's the same thing what you're what you're talking about. At this point, they called you up, you know, you got a name. It's a main event spot. You take your picking and choosing your fights. But what was George like? Because you're getting an early, young George St. Pierre, and you're the old lion at this point. Um, well, the crazy thing about that, I was in decent shape. It was a short nose fight, maybe ten days, and I went out to um, Rockford or Rockton, Illinois, um, to, with uh, with uh, Justin Weeman and. Brad Lynn to train with them for the weekend before that fight. Um, because they had really good wrestlers. I really wanted to work a wrestling thing and stuff like that. So I went out there. I met uh Pat and Ron and I think Garrity came out with us. So it was a real good training camp. We were in great shape and stuff like that. Um, but I remember I put on wrestling shoes and when I tied my shoes, it felt like there was a rock right by the laces. And I'm like, God, that's a weird feeling. So train and stuff like that. But I found out that I had MRSA in my ankle. And mm -hmm. so so I had MRSA that Saturday. Sunday, I had to go to the hospital, spend the night because I had MRSA in my that ankle joint. And I was on crutches that Monday. And I was walking out of the hospital, and my ex fiance goes, hey, you can't fight because the fight was Friday or Saturday. And I said, you're right, because I was on crutches. And so I, I called up Pat. I said, hey, I can't fight. I'm on crutches. And Pat goes, and I remember his word. He goes, Dave, they bought the ticket already. You have to go. And then I was like, ah, oh, you're right. I have to. So I said, fine, I'll do it. And then 
So I, I couldn't run. I couldn't do anything to cut weight. So I had a hard, little harder time to cut weight. Well, what happened was we get to the airport and they lose my luggage. Luggage never comes through or anything like that. And then when we're going through customs, um, you know, Ron and I were together and they asked me, they said, hey, wherever you guys ever arrested. And when I was in college, I'd been arrested, right? Not charged with anything, but twice, right? It's just silly college things. And Ron, Ron told me before, don't say you were. I said, no, I wasn't. And Ron's there, he goes, nope, I haven't. And he goes, are you guys sure? Because we can check. And no, no. Are you sure? Because finally said, yeah, once when I was in college. So they made us go into like a waiting room. And Ron's like, why the hell would you say that? I said, I don't know. They kept repeating it. I thought maybe they knew. And so I was kind of worried. And then what you call them? As I was like, you know, sitting there and stuff like that, the guy comes back probably like an hour later. And, you know, the promoter was, I think, calling maybe you or something like that. Are you sure they got on a plane? We can't find it. And so um, they came back and said, no, you came up clean, but Ron had something. And I'm like, shoot, I'm going to lose my corner man or something like that. But they let us in because Ron talked his way in or something like that. I said, but hey, I don't have my bag. I can't find my bag. And I go, oh, here's a number. So he has a call number. So we went to the hotel and stuff like that. And every time we'd call the number, it was in French. They were in Montreal. And I couldn't hear it. So I had like the people at the front of the hotel keep calling, keep calling. And they couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. I was like, Ron, what are we going to do? So I only had the clothes on my back. So I'm trying to cut weight and you know, wearing maybe bronze clothes or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to wear, I think I wore Jeff Curran shorts and I had to go buy a mouth card and a cup and like, we couldn't find anywhere to boil water. So I was running around the stadium in Montreal right half hour, two hours before the fight. And they had to boil my mouth guard in weenie water, you know, where they boil hot dogs in order oh. for me to fit it. <laughs> so that's how I, I had Jeff Curran shorts on. I had weenie water mouthpiece on. And, you know, I didn't know if I even had a sweatshirt or anything to warm up. But I, you know, I went out there and uh, fought like that. I mean, like I said, it was one of those situations. Um, and after the fight, the crazy thing was, you know, I'm just like pissed, you know, just kind of a mess. We go to check in the fly back, right? And I'm going there and we go up to the lady right there at the front desk and like we're checking in and stuff like that. And I said, Hey, did anybody find my bag? Just like just kind of like that. She goes, Oh yeah, here it is. And she just goes right behind the counter and she pulls it out and gives me my bag. It was like sitting behind the counter for three, four days, whatever it was. Oh, and I'm God. like, nobody else could give me that. No, you know what I mean? So that was the whole trip to Canada, Montreal. So, so and what was St. Pierre? What was St. Pierre like? Because he's he usually gets, you know, when he became a big star, he, he he was a gentleman and he always conducted himself pretty good. But some of those early Canadian shows on the smaller side could be pretty rugged. Um, now he was no, he was nice and stuff like that. He was polite. Um, I do remember him being like explosive and. But he didn't feel as strong as I thought he would. He wasn't like really strong. I thought Nick Aguilar and Hank Aguilar were stronger, you know, with the grip strength. And so he didn't feel like super strong. I mean, he was fast and explosive, but um, I didn't find him as strong. Um, he, you know, he was quick though. So cool, cool. All right, brother, we're coming up on two hours. We've been talking. I can keep it going for a bunch too, but. Uh... I want to give you and your family a break and, and thank you very much for this time. I, I just want to point out to the, to the people out there, you know, Dave's a school teacher now, and he probably hasn't really watched or done a bunch of UFC stuff in a long time. We're taping this at the same time that John Jones is returning to the Octagon for, you know, the first time in three years. And I would have rather, you know, I'm glad I spent the time with Dave and I don't really care what happened there. I'll catch up to it afterwards. When was the last time you saw UFC, buddy? Um, you know what? If if I don't have anybody invested or something like that, I don't really watch that much. Um you know, I mean I uh Gerald Mearshrant, remember him? He came through our gym. Um, so you know, I, I, I like to pick up clips of him. He's he's one of those guys from uh, uh sure. Racine area, so 
if, if people are involved, I'll, I'll see the clips of those people and stuff like that, but it's not something that I look into that much. I understand. Cool. And uh, why don't you go ahead and give the address for your gym up in the Milwaukee area because, uh, you know, racing and, and wherever you are now, because I think you got two spots too. Doesn't Garrity run a spot for you? Give, right. give us no. Um, Kenosha, Wisconsin, it's on 3309 60th Street in Kenosha. And in Waukegan, Illinois, I have one at 125 Corey Avenue in Waukegan, Illinois. And that's where Garrity's uh, the, the leader. Uh, actually, Garrity doesn't do it. He works for UPS now. Um, okay. Uh, Jose Vega runs it. And Jose Vega is one of those littler guys that can punch so hard. Um, just, I mean, he's he's the one that, when with us not doing that many shows and stuff like that, it's, you know, I think he misses his window, which is a shame because he would have been super good at 125. Yep, yep, for sure. And sometimes it's a bittersweet sport, my friend. Thank you very much for catching up with us here at the MMA Museum. All right, thank you.